Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. I'm Dan Lemieux, County Board Chairman, co-host of this show that we put on every month. And hosting with me is Adam Payne, our Administrative Coordinator. Uh, this month we are focusing on the Veteran Service Department for Sheboygan County. And we have with us as our guest, Jim Riesenberg, a Veteran Service Officer. Um, we're approaching Memorial Day weekend, Jim, and, and Sheboygan County, I believe, has approximately 10,000 veterans uh, located, living in, residing in Sheboygan County. And we'd like to not only discuss the function of your office, but also some of the activities coming up for Memorial Day later on in the show. But why don't you start today, Jim, by just giving us a little background about yourself and when you became involved with the Veteran Service Office? Well, uh, Dan, I've been a Veteran Service Officer since uh, January of 1987. Uh, I'm the fifth person to serve in that position, which was created uh, by the Sheboygan County Board in 1936. Uh, the population figure is fairly close, about uh, 10,100 more or less. Uh, personally, uh, I'm the second of eight children, uh, five brothers who served 34 years, seven months and 24 days in the Army, Navy, Marine Corps and Air Force during the Vietnam War. And in order to be a veteran service officer, you need to be a veteran too, I'm assuming. Uh, one of the stipulations in Chapter 45, which governs uh, Veterans Affairs in Wisconsin, uh, mandates uh, honorable active service any time in your lifetime, correct? And maybe you could just give us a little background as to the, the mission of the department and uh, some of the responsibilities of the veteran well, our, service. Uh, our mission statement is, is relatively simple, to serve those who served. Uh, and we basically, uh, our mission is to uh, contribute to the quality of life based to the former men and women who have served in our armed forces. Uh, the men and women we serve obviously have to be honorably discharged service personnel. Uh, they are wards of the Department of Defense as long as they're on active duty. Uh, they obtain veteran status at one second past midnight on their last day of active duty and that's when they come to us for assistance. And then, when they come to you for assistance, what are some of the programs and services that you provide to them? We have a ton of stuff. Uh, basically, we have, we have three sources of uh, programs that we administer. Uh, uh, Sheboygan County, uh, from the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs, and from the Federal U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, or the VA. Uh, you could probably lump those programs into four categories, I would say, uh, housing, health care, memorial affairs, and education. Now, as far as the uh, housing part of it is concerned, uh, the biggie there is the primary mortgage programs run by both the state and the federal VA, uh, as well as the home improvement loan program of the uh, state VA. Health care, obviously, is the, uh, probably the big ticket item. The VA, federal VA operates uh, 172 health care facilities, major hospitals uh, throughout the United States. And as such, they are the largest single health care delivery system in the free world. Uh, add to that the, uh, the myriad of new outpatient clinics that have, have been built around the country. Uh, and that pretty much encompasses everything that the federal VA provides. At the state level, uh, of course, we have the uh, health care aid grant. We have the Wisconsin Veterans Home at King and the soon to be opened uh, community based residential care facility uh, at the Southern Center in Union Grove. Also at the state level, as, as far as uh, housing is the veterans or medical care, I'm sorry, is the uh, veterans assistance program which uh, offers uh, uh, transitional housing and employment for homeless veterans. In the education part of it, you'd find, uh, of course, the obvious one there, again, the biggie is the now Chapter 30 of the Montgomery GI Bill, the Federal Education Program, which offers financial assistance to uh, those servicemen and women who uh, are on active duty or have completed active duty. Uh, and it also recognizes the continued involvement of our reserve forces by uh, making uh, financial funds available to those reservists uh, with a six-year military obligation. 
At the state level, we have the uh, full-time tuition and fees reimbursement program. Uh, we have the part-time study grant reimbursement program, and we have the retraining grant program for those uh, recently terminated from employment or about to be terminated. And as far as memorial affairs, well, I think that's pretty much self-explanatory. Memorial affairs uh, basically deals with the, uh, the casket flags, the grave markers, uh, the uh, graveside uh, military rites and the, the flags and flag holders uh, that go on to cemeteries on Memorial Day. You mentioned, uh, you just went through a, quite a long laundry list there. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> and that's only part of it. Uh, uh, well, and we only have 30 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> but you mentioned services provided by the state and by the federal government. Mm. Uh, obviously, you're not the end all when, when somebody applies for all these. So do you work closely with these agencies, the state and federal agencies, on a regular basis? Or? Yes, we do, Dan. Uh, one thing, uh, it depends on the situation, uh, the particular need. Uh, if it's a, if it's a educational program, obviously it's pretty much cut and dried. Uh, if it's a health care need, it's probably a little bit different if it's a, a pension issue. Uh, we work with uh, Social Security on a daily basis. We work with uh, the people at the, economic, the county's economic support programs and a lot of other uh, state and federal programs that might be out there uh, that would provide some type of assistance depending on the applicant's need. There are a lot of programs out there uh, and a lot of uh, red tape, and not red tape, but a lot of paperwork to go through. We don't do anything without paper uh, and it's, it's our responsibility to uh, try and coordinate uh, as much as we can so the applicant will get the greatest uh, benefit from the program. Uh, and there's no putting two fists in the pot at one time. Uh, double dipping is frowned upon by the government, as you might expect. Some people get away with it, but not for very long, and a lot of times it's uh, unintentional. Sometimes it is, but our primary responsibility in that area is to see that they get all they have coming, but also to make sure that they don't get too much. So if a veteran is watching this show uh, sometime during the month of May and, and hears about one of these programs and, and thinks, I might, I might be able to qualify or this might be able to help me, how does a veteran go about looking into these programs and, and getting access to some of these services? Well, there are several ways, uh, Dan. I would say probably uh, the first thing, if you are within driving distance, come down to the office. Uh, if you see me downtown, for heaven's sakes, don't be afraid to stop me. A lot of people do. Uh, you can also, <clears throat> the VA regional office, the federal VA, has a toll-free uh, national hotline, uh, the 1-800-827-1000. And wherever you live in the United States, that number will ring through to the regional office. Uh, and depending on what you're inquiring about, 99% uh, of the time the, uh, the uh, benefits counselors at the regional office will refer you back to the Veterans Service Office uh, in your county of domicile or wherever you live. You mentioned earlier that the mission statement of your department was to serve those who have served, or I, I believe I... That's close. That's close. Um, how many... Veterans do you work with on a, on a regular basis? I mean, I'm, I'm a veteran, and I think I contacted your office about 30 years ago one time, <laughs> and, and not since. Yeah. So, so how, how, many, how many of these 10,100 do you deal with on a regular basis? Uh, that's, that's, kind of a, that's a kind of a tough figure to deal with. Uh, I can tell you this, the, the ones that we do deal with, uh, we try to deal with, with courtesy, compassion, and understanding. I think probably a better barometer of, of the level of our activity and involvement would probably be the fiscal impact that uh, veterans programs have in, on the economy of Sheboygan County. Uh, I don't have current figures, but I can tell you uh, based on uh, annual reports that I have worked on, it probably averages somewhere between uh, 15 and 18 million dollars a year. Uh, that includes such things as the value of homes guaranteed under the, uh, the state and federal loan guarantee programs, the compensation, uh, the pension, uh, the vocational rehabilitation, and this type of thing. So it, for, for us, the, uh, about 10 to 12% of the population that uh, we service, 
uh, and if you use the multiplier figure on the 14 to 15 to 18 million dollars, I think the fiscal impact of veterans programs in this county uh, is a rather significant number given the small number of people, <clears throat> excuse me, given the small number of people that we provide service to. And we, we've been talking about the veterans, but what about their uh, spouses and, and the immediate families? Do you, uh, do you work with them also? Yes, we do, Dan. We have uh, most all of the programs, uh, with just a couple of exceptions, most all of the programs, both state, uh, county, state, and federal, do have a, a system whereby we can provide uh, some type of uh, assistance, depending, again, on the need. Uh, the spouse and qualifying dependents uh, also have access to, not all, but some of these programs and the important programs, uh, the, widows, the widow's pension, the, the health care aid grants, and the, the uh, uh, part-time study reimbursement program from the state of Wisconsin. Some of what you would call programs that, that tend to lead to uh, or lean toward quality of life, what we refer to as quality of life type programs. Memorial Day weekend is nearly here, and I know a lot of people look forward to the three-day weekend or vacationing with their family, mm -hmm. uh, self-included. I also um, appreciate that a lot of people may not think about the significance of Memorial Day, especially our younger folks. What does Memorial Day mean to you, Jim? Well, I'm, I guess I'm probably one from the old school in that uh, I've always felt that Memorial Day uh, is the day set aside to pay tribute to our fallen comrades. And I, I think uh, what I've said for many years is, uh, uh, even before I got this job, when I was active in the American Legion, uh, Memorial Day was not created by Madison Avenue to give the mall a reason to have a four-day sale. And it wasn't created by the tourism industry to signal the start of the tourism season. There, there are a lot of uh, uh, things, and obviously Memorial Day uh, does take on a different meaning, I probably to those who so-called been there, done that, probably a whole lot different than for other people. I think the significance of the day is that we send on to the younger generation uh, the fact that uh, freedom isn't free. Uh, we pause and, and remember those who served, and those who sacrificed. And if you uh, walk through a cemetery sometime, or even as you drive by, but if you walk through a cemetery and, and look at a marker under one of those flags, uh, Company H, 127th Infantry, 1776. And take yourself back to the Civil War and imagine you know, what they were doing, a brother fighting a brother, or someone who, in the, who lost their life during, the Civil, during, the, during World War II, or Korea, or Vietnam. And imagine you know, what they were doing. Uh, how did they die? What, uh, what did their families go through while they were gone? What were they going through while they were over there? And I, I think that's one way to instill, probably in yourself, uh, go to the library and get a book and read something about some of these things that actually happened. And you probably not only get a, a, a better understanding, but hopefully something that you can someday share with somebody. So it, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, given the background in my family in the military, uh, it's a very personal day for me, as is Veterans Day. What are some of the key events and activities you're going to be helping coordinate this month? Too many. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, there are quite a few activities planned, and I think uh, I certainly would encourage everyone to check with the newspaper uh, and make sure that you know if there's one going on in your town. I think just about every uh, village uh, and city and community in Sheboygan County uh, does have something going on. Uh, personally, we've worked with the United Military Association in Sheboygan, as we always do, uh, putting, uh, helping put the project together. Uh, I myself will be marching uh, with the, in the Sheboygan Parade with the Vietnam Veterans of America Color Guard. Uh, we'll be making a presentation, I believe, out at uh, Green Lawn out on County Trunk O, uh, participating in their program. And uh, other than that, I probably will be over at the Plymouth Legion uh, sitting around telling war stories and just uh, enjoying a day away from the office, doing what I do at the office, but not in the office. If people want to get more information about those events, they can contact your office or be looking for well, it in the newspaper? Uh, probably. We'll have some of the information. We don't generally get that deeply involved. Sometimes they tell us 
Sometimes they don't. We encourage them, at least get it out to the newspaper, get it out to the media. You'll get a greater number of people uh, attention that way than you will trying to send it to our office. Earlier you mentioned the flags that are placed at the grave sites uh, for Memorial Day. And I imagine that is a, a tremendous task each year. How many flags are actually placed and how do you go about coordinating that every year? That, well, uh, the coordination part is relatively easy. easy. I've got a very dependable staff who takes care of all of that. Uh, the, the county, uh, through the budget process, purchases the flags. Uh, last year we put out, uh, I think, roughly 7,700. So this year I have a feeling it's probably going to be close to uh, 8,000 flags uh, will be placed in uh, 110 cemeteries in Sheboygan County. Uh, we do that. The late Al Sterling laid out a plan for us uh, with 26 veterans organizations geographically located throughout Sheboygan County. So Al laid out a plan where uh, uh, certain organizations would be assigned to the cemeteries in their area. So nobody is really overloaded, so everybody pretty much has an equal task with a couple of exceptions. I think Wildwood Cemetery here in the city of Sheboygan has like 1,600. Uh, the Sharp Cemetery out in Elkhart Lake uh, is the final resting place of one Edwin Sharp's Civil War soldier. And he's the only, uh, the only uh, person laid to rest in that grave, and, and he's a veteran. But uh, it's a big job. They'll be doing it starting this weekend uh, someplace, some places in the county. I know you mentioned you have a, a pretty good staff. In your office in the courthouse, mm -hmm. you have one person. So it must be the, the organizations that are really working with you to help accomplish this. The, organ the organizations do a lot. We are the, the, uh, the focal point for all of the activities, including the death benefits. And, and when a veteran passes away, our office is usually uh, somewhere in the process of getting called. Uh, our office is responsible for uh, recording the uh, location of all veterans' graves in our county and sending that on to the Department of Veterans Affairs in Madison for future generations or for whatever reason, but the veterans, uh, the veterans organizations do the bulwark or the heavy work. They pick up the flags and the flag holders. Uh, they are the ones who are physically responsible for walking up and down those long rows with bundles of flags and calling out names and making sure that the flags are in place. Let's hear a little bit more about the organizations. 26 organizations, I imagine, they have a, a variety of, of areas of focus. What can yeah. you tell us about them? Well, uh, yes, we do have, there are 26. We've got the Veterans of Foreign Wars, uh, the American Legion, uh, Disabled American Veterans, Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, Catholic War Veterans of America, retired enlisted and retired officers. Uh, all of them have, have one thing in common, and that's honorable active military service. And beyond that, uh, well, the military of the Purple Heart, for example, you obviously you have to be combat wounded uh, and be a recipient of the Purple Heart. Uh, VFW, uh, obviously, uh, during a war uh, conflict and uh, served on foreign soil. Uh, disabled American veterans, uh, service-related disabled. Retired officers, retired enlisted, uh, pretty much uh, just uh, be, be retired and, and of honorable active service and you would pretty much qualify for membership. They all uh, uh, do have one common focus and that is service to veterans. Uh, I would say this, if there is a classroom anywhere in any school in this county that does not, does not have a flag in it, I want to know about it because there are organizations out there that will make sure that there are flags in every classroom and if you need help with the Pledge of Allegiance, we'll get somebody out there to do that for you too. Every year the veteran population is decreasing and, and with it first-hand experience of the sacrifices for the, for the quality of life we enjoy today. Um, I know you touched on it earlier, but again, what would you recommend to get younger people and families uh, more involved with appreciating the meaning of Memorial Day? Well, I guess, you know, it's been, uh, it's something that I've, one thing that I've started on since I, I, I took this job was trying to get the veterans organizations together, uh, different veterans from different war periods and go into our, our schools, especially the, the grade schools and the high schools. And, and share your, your wartime experiences. Not necessarily uh, the blood and guts, but what was Paris really like in 1944? Or what was Saigon like in 1977? Or what was Hong Chin Korea like in 1953? And things are, what was London like? 
when we were over there and under Eisenhower, you know the rest of the, the song and dance about that. But, you know, and I think, uh, and I've been moderately successful. Uh, some uh, are rather reluctant to even say anything about it, but a lot of them have gotten together from all of the war periods and, and gone in uh, and talked about it. But, you know, every time uh, we lose a veteran in this county, every, roughly every 36 hours, one passes away. And uh, when that happens, I always felt that uh, a piece of history you know, goes into the ground with them, never to be heard again by anybody. So my suggestion would be, if you have family or friends or parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, or somebody, sit down with a tape recorder and record, uh, ask, talk, talk and ask questions and ask them what it was like. And you know, we don't necessarily have to hear about the blood and guts and anything like that, but. Every serviceman had a different service number and a, and, a, and a different experience and a different reaction to, to everything that happened to them, no matter where it was. From, from uh, the World War I veteran telling about the time he got on the boat in New York on, on Armistice Day in 1918 and went overseas to, to serve. There's, there's always a story to be told. And uh, if you can find somebody to help you to record it, to tell the stories, uh, I think that's something that would really probably give you more appreciation for the guy who, who, who either almost froze to death or almost fried wherever he was. You know, and I think uh, if you know what they did and if you know what they went through, it probably would give you a little uh, deeper appreciation uh, for not only what your kin went through, but probably also what, what others went through as well. Uh, I was home in 91, shortly after uh, the Persian Gulf activity broke out. And as I, and I mentioned, I was talking to my parents, and we were talking about that, and Ma had just come home from visiting somebody in the neighborhood and their nephew or someone who was, was ordered to active duty. And I, I, said to, I said to my mother, I said, geez, I said, what did you guys do? I said, you know, when you look back, I said, from, from 1960 to 1982, you had one in uniform all the time, at least one. You had one time you had two in the war zone. At one time you had three in the war zone. I said, what did you do? She said, we prayed a lot. You know? and, and these are the kind of things, if you can get people to, to talk about those things, uh, might be an, a whole new experience for you. Right. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Jim, we, we talked a little bit about before we came on, and, and there's a lot of things we haven't touched on yet. Um, you have one of the smallest departments in, in, in county, in Sheboygan County government, with yourself and one staff member, but a uh, tremendous impact on the community, on, on the veterans that have, have served for us. And, and I have a little better idea now of the impact that you have on the lives of these individuals. But one of the things we, we, uh, we wanted to talk about a little bit today was a, a recent press article uh, talked about a 26-mile a, a march, the uh, Bataan Memorial Death March that Correct. you participated in, or are you participating in this more often, uh, more mm -hmm. often than just this last year. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that, and, and what, what, what's the meaning of that march? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the march itself commemorates uh, the surrender of the Bataan Peninsula and subsequently uh, the island of Corregidor in the Philippines on April 9, 1942. Uh, and that was shortly after the invasion of Pearl Harbor. Uh, General Wainwright was in charge of the, uh, of the operation under General MacArthur. And uh, he was ordered to surrender, so they uh, destroyed everything that they had and began the 66 march to, to Camp O'Donnell. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to quote figures, that, uh, but if I recall from the newspaper article, and those were taken from the, uh, the uh, official website, uh, the number of men uh, who survived that, that march was, was uh, uh, rather minimal compared to, compared to the, when you think of the, the number of people who actually uh, took off and, and started off in that march. Uh, they marched uh, night and day, uh, 103 degree weather, uh, whatever they had on when they took off, when they started marching is what they had. If they lost it, if they went back to pick it up or something, the, the enemy shot them. You know, it just, uh, I think the, 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 the thing about this, and I don't know if, if you can pick up that book or not, but 
But uh, if you have a chance, read this book. Uh, if you never read another book about, about how our men were treated in the Pacific, read this book. Uh, I cried when I read it, and I, I think you probably will too. But uh, the march itself is interesting. Uh, it's extremely challenging. Uh, but for someone who walks 4,000 miles a year, uh, the, the challenge itself uh, of walking wasn't as much of a challenge as listening to these men uh, as they talk and to think that they survived an ordeal like this. It's, 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 it's phenomenal, to say the least. Thank you, Jim. I, I, I can just feel the passion in your voice uh, and the passion that you bring to the job. Uh, I would hope that all of our employees and all of our, our department heads uh, bring that same passion. Anything else that we, uh, that we neglected to ask you that you're just at the tip of your tongue that you want to <laughs> get out to the public yet in the last couple of minutes? But no, I, th I think, I think the, the important thing to realize is you know, that we're starting to do uh, outreach now. Uh, in fact, uh, we're going out to the meal sites in the county uh, two days a month. Uh, we're, uh, this month, uh, Howard's Grove in Plymouth. Next month, I think, uh, Adel and Random Lake. And we're doing an outreach effort to reach some of the uh, older veteran population in our community, uh, thinking that it's probably easier for them to get downtown than in Random Lake or wherever they're at than it is to get in, into the city. Uh, we, do, we have a, an outreach uh, program that we focus on, on the, and actually focus on the veteran population. And we have a public awareness uh, effort that we focus on the non-veteran portion of our population because we know uh, that while not everyone is a veteran, everyone seems to know a veteran somewhere, somehow. So, and we, we try to spread the word and make them understand that just because Uncle Louie didn't get it, anything from the VA doesn't mean that you're not going to get anything. Uh, well, he did the exact same thing as I did, not necessarily. So, and it's, it's difficult sometimes to convince some of the, uh, some of the older population that there, there are programs out there that may benefit them. I think the big thing uh, right now is in the field of healthcare uh, with the new clinic opening at, at Cleveland not too long ago and, and the VA putting new clinics up uh, throughout not only Wisconsin but uh, throughout the United States in an attempt to, to reach these veterans. And again, as you might expect, uh, the, the out-of-sight cost of prescription medication uh, is what the majority of them are coming in to get help for. And it, it's just, you know, when you can get somebody's medication cost down from $300 a month to $30 a month, uh, you have to feel good about it. <clears throat> and this person also has to know, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that this person also has to know that uh, in spite of the fact that they never got a bonus from the state of Wisconsin, they are getting something probably a little bit more meaningful than a fistful of dollars and a goodbye. And it, it's, uh, the, the response has been just really tremendous and uh, we're quite pleased with it. It's not something that helps everybody, but uh, for the majority of people who get into the system, uh, it, is, it is a godsend. Thank you, Jim. Hmm? I really appreciate your, your presentation and I hope uh, everybody gets to do this before Memorial Day and, and, and use this as a reminder to get out to those the services and the, and the, the uh, cemeteries and, and, and be a part of Memorial Day this year. Next month, we'll be bringing as our guest, Vern Gross, our Director of Building Services. Um, I was surprised when I got on the county board 13 months ago, uh, the number of buildings that, that Sheboygan County is responsible for, the number of highway sheds, the uh, UW Sheboygan system that we're responsible for, uh, just the number of buildings and, and properties that uh, Sheboygan County is responsible for. And Vern's going to be here next month, and along with Adam and myself, and we're going to be talking about uh, the buildings and, and the responsibility we have and possibly even uh, touch a little bit on, on some of the building programs that we have going on right now uh, through Sheboygan County. Thank you, and we'll see you again next month. <laughs>